I am here with Sarah Adcock. She is the next in a series of artists interviews that we are highlighting in conjunction with our summer virtual exhibition, Art Connects, Forging Partnerships Through Art, which is a exhibition in collaboration between Great Falls Public Schools art faculty and CM Russell Museum staff. And so Sarah is here to tell us a little bit about her position at the museum as well as her work as an artist. So Sarah, welcome. And uh, can you just start out by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do for your job at the museum and also a little bit about your artwork? Yes, thank you so much. Um, so again, hi, I'm Sarah Adcock. I recently moved to Montana from Missouri. I'm originally from Illinois, but I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis with my master's in fine art. So my background has a lot to do with um, sculpture and studio art. So um, I do some painting on the side and I essentially I do a little bit of everything. I kind of dabble. At the museum, I'm, I'm an assistant curator. So I do research work with um, archives and different artifacts. And um, I also help hang, hang work and do a lot of preparatory stuff as well. So um, again, I dabble a little bit in everything there too. So you're very similar to Charlie Russell in that you dabble in sculpture and dabble in painting. <laughs> you do a little bit of it all. And artists tend to work across multiple art mediums. So can you tell me a little bit about why you, it sounds like you primarily work in sculpture. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about why that art medium intrigues you and why you focus in that area. And then how the art or the painting on the side may or may not influence that or be a separate subset of that? Starting off, um, when I started off in, in school with art, I was into painting. And I was really kind of trying to focus on being as realistic as I could and doing a lot of still lives. And I enjoyed it and I loved, uh, loved painting. Um, kind of fell in love with watercolor for a while um, because it was so challenging. It doesn't do what you want it to do. And for me, that was so hard to try to control. I mean, I wanted to control everything and watercolor right. really had to learn to let go. And so I kind of fell in love with that challenge. And at some point I realized that painting wasn't enough for me, that I wanted a little more of a challenge. And so that's what kind of pushed me to sculpture. And for me, that was thinking about everything that it could be, how it's not just a 2D object, but you have to think in the round and where a viewer actually has to be positioned to see it and how that the challenges of even setting it up and making sure it doesn't fall down. I mean, there's a whole bunch of um, different challenges and aspects to sculpture that I really fell in love with. Medium wise, I'm really drawn to wax. So at first it was encaustics and painting with encaustic waxes. Um, but then I went to sculpture and I didn't really want to give up wax yet. There was just something about it, the quality and how visceral it was. It was just one of those things that I just became so fascinated and just wanted to continue to push it and see what happened. So I started making um, full body casts of different objects and people. That's and, neat. And, yeah, and then I burned them. <laughs> Um, I actually was um, setting my sculptures on fire. So I was trying to work with the different elements as well. Um, took me a long time to come to terms with that, that my sculptures were not going to live forever, that they were ephemeral and they had a, they had a life and I had to learn to let go. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was pretty hard, but the quality of the wax and the materials that I was using I think that's probably the biggest thing that I learned as an artist is how to work with those and pull those qualities out that they inform my concept and help inform the viewer instead of me trying to tell a story I was letting the materials do that. I really like that idea of ephemeral objects because that's like a lot like life you can't preserve anything like you know it, it all, it's like things happen and then right. people try to preserve them by like you know freezing a piece of your wedding cake or you know maintaining a ring from your grandmother for like 
your whole life and then passing it on to like your child. But things really past the moment aren't concrete. And I always like, I, I really like that ability to let go. It's a beautiful concept in art because it's also a beautiful practice to be able to do in life. And I don't know that a lot of people are really truly able to do it. And so like kind of allow it to happen knowingly in your art process when our art is kind of like our baby, right? right. Like, oh my God. It, 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 and then you have to burn it. Yes. And that, that, that was the hardest thing for me. I remember my, um, my senior uh, show in undergrad, and that's when I had really started working with wax and this idea of ephemeral. And I did, I remember like the next day after my opening, I just like, had zero like my emotions had just been wiped away because I just I didn't know I didn't know what to think and how to take it because I had worked all year on making the show and by the end of the night they were as most people would say are gone mm -hmm. I mean they were gone but they weren't and that was the beautiful thing about wax they had transformed literally before your eyes it was an experience so everyone who got to go there got to see and experience and you know smell the the flame and and hear the flame and then they got to see the wax actually physically melt into something new transformed um so that's another thing i like to kind of think of my work a little bit as alchemy of taking a you know um one thing and turning it into something completely new now i'm actually not physically turning wax into something else you know i'm not i'm not doing that but i am transforming the idea and the concept of what it is and so that's kind of what my challenge has always been is trying to find those ideas and or find the the stories and things that kind of motivate me and trans you know transcend those and make those into art um what inspires or influences the art that you make oh yes so for a long time i was fascinated with the idea of fairy tales in kind of mythology. I loved uh, ancient Greek mythology and literature and it was a really big passion of mine. And then I realized that I can actually incorporate those ideals and kind of those life lessons that are hidden within those and put them in my art. Um, not necessarily trying to recreate a story literally from the pages. I didn't, I wasn't trying to take a fairy tale and then just illustrate it. What I was trying to do is take the idea and kind of flip it on its head and really make you think about how those stories still relate to our lives today. So a lot of my work deals with this idea of kind of memory and the concepts of hidden within these kind of mythological narratives and bringing those into today and kind of forcing you to think about things and really question what it means to be something. What is your favorite fairy tale? Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> um, uh, actually, it's uh, one of my favorites is called Seven Ravens. It's by the Grimm Brothers. It's not a well-known fairy tale, um, but it is pretty beautiful. It's about a girl who, well, when she's born, she's close to death. And she had seven older brothers. And the mother asked them to go get water from a well. And they all fought over who was going to save her, that they thought that bringing this water to her was gonna save her life. And they dropped the bucket and kind of ruined everything. And then the mother cursed them and they turned into ravens. So the little girl grew up not knowing she had brothers. And so throughout this whole story, it's about her realizing and finding out she does have family and then she's going to go rescue them. So this idea that this girl thinks it's her fault, even though it had, she had nothing to do with it, it was never her fault. Um, she didn't curse them, it wasn't her fault that she was born sick, but she decides to go and rescue her family. And she does, she perseveres and she gets to go through all these different hardships. And it's really, um, it's kind of just a beautiful story of how things work out. Um, it's not necessarily a happy ending, which I don't mind either. I mean, right. those original grim fairy tales are not pleasant by any means. They're definitely not Disney. Um, but it's, I, I love that perseverance and taking ownership of something 
and not necessarily thinking something's your fault, but to continue and persevere anyways. So you've talked a little bit about your creative process and that you like to create things out of wax or wax is one of your favorite mm -hmm. materials to use. And then you had, you would set them on fire, yeah. um, which I think is so neat. Um, so is there anything else that you can tell me about your creative process and how you go from start to finish on a piece of work? And so what I'm hearing when you talk about the fairy tales as influences and then this like kind of really neat um, ephemeral concept of creating and then just destroying for lack of a better term creating and then allowing something to transform I think is what you said the word you use and probably yes. better so what can you tell me about that like full creative process when you go from like maybe seeing what inspires you or it, it it's like a particular I don't know what it is maybe it's a particular fairy tale and then how do you go from like taking that concept and translating it into the work of art that you want to create? My creative process kind of differs between a couple different things. If I'm working with a sculpture, I usually like to start with um, a, a rough idea and just kind of like a seed, which could be sparked from um, some kind of mythological narrative, fairy tale, whatever it be. And from there, I do a lot of research. I try to find the original. I try to um, read different versions of, of that. And then from there I start sketching. And I, this is where it becomes a little tricky for me because I can actually find myself going down a rabbit hole of thinking too much. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing I learned while I was in grad school um, was that I just needed to make and just start making something. It didn't matter if it was small or really large and just kind of grand and crazy. Mm -hmm. I needed to start making and doing something. And that's where I solved a lot of my problems. So for me, it had a lot to do with, usually my process goes from like a reading research kind of orientation. And that's kind of where my histor um, historical background kind of comes in. I like to do that. Um, and then it just becomes doing and from there, that's where I can solve problems. And I can always go back and do a little more research. And that usually comes in at the end. And that's more of um, researching how to finish, you know, if, how I want this concept to be viewed by someone, you know, how, you know, is it against a wall? Is it standing alone? How um, I physically present it to the world. That research comes towards the end, but usually it's, little bit of research and then a lot of doing. And then I do also, um, there are times I do go back to painting, um, which is what I actually have in the, in the, um, this gallery, this exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, painting becomes a, um, a bit of a cleanser. And so if I get stuck, if I kind of start to overthink something. I like to go back to painting because for me, it lets me clear my mind. Mm -hmm. I can just, you know, put brush to canvas and kind of get out of my own head. And I need that sometimes. Some, I like to overthink. Yeah. Painting, painting is a nice in-between process. Um, so usually while I'm sculpting, I am painting at the same time. But for me, that's, um, that's to clear my head or to work out different, like problem solving. And your paintings are very lovely. The one you have in the show is a really lovely, touching image. Thank you. So yeah. that's like, it's different than the burning the fairy tales to the ground. <laughs> yeah. a, a little bit different, um, but within the same kind of concept, um, this idea of, of memory and um, touch. Mm -hmm. So um, I work with my hands, you know, I sculpt with my hands. You can physically see my hands in my work. And for me, I kind of fell in love with the idea of hands and how they really interact with our lives and how we touch others' lives. Mm -hmm. So um, that paint, that painting's near and dear to my heart. It was based off of a photograph that I took of um, my grandfather the day before he passed. And so it has a lot to do with memory and it has my mother and my grandmother are also 
pictured in it. So for me, it had a lot to do with kind of generational and this idea of passing along some kind of knowledge and oral tradition, which is what, you know, fairy tales are. So for me, it had a lot to do, kind of still within the same concepts of what my sculptures were, but just, I guess, just a little more modern, you know. It's a very beautiful image and I can, how they're, each hand is kind of holding each other in like a circle. Yeah. So. And again, it goes back to that ephemeral quality mm -hmm. too within my work of, you know, setting things on fire. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that was um, something that I did in between. I was when I was actually working on my thesis. I was working on that one as well. I had a very huge sculpture that was very time consuming. And so that one was my, my, um, my in between and, and helped me kind of process and clear my head. It's something that uh, I've also been kind of fascinated with or talking about these social taboos. I mean, a lot of people don't like talking about death and I completely understand that. Um, but I kind of like breaching the subject within my work mm -hmm. just because I believe it's, it's important to talk about these things. I think it's important to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. I think that's the only way how we're going to learn to get past these social indifferences that are happening and all the other, you know, horrible things that are happening right now. If no one's willing to talk about it. And I mean, talk, not, not just disagree and argue. And right. Be willing to actually listen to someone and be able to be heard. And I think that's what, that's why I'm, you know, I, I like to talk about these, you know, the social limitations of things and taboos surrounding things, because that's what starts conversations. The next question I really, really like. What is one piece of advice that you would give to young people or aspiring artists? Uh, okay. So a piece of advice that I would give to young aspiring artists um, would actually be advice that I got in grad school and um, from a very near and dear friend of mine, a professor. And he told me, just make it. It doesn't matter what it is, but you have to physically do something and just start making. And it doesn't matter if you make a million little things that are horrible <laughs> or what you think is horrible, because you're going to learn a million different ways of how to do something or, and you can use those skills later on. So for me, I always got in my head and I would kind of go down that rabbit hole, like I said, of researching, researching and just need to physically make something and just do it. But there's no crazy idea out there that you can't do. You just have to do it, just have to start. So the reason we're doing this exhibition online is because during the planning phase, things were really uncertain. And we couldn't guarantee that and you know this because you work here in the museum, we couldn't guarantee that our exhibition could physically be up and that we physically have people in. So then we moved to this virtual platform. And a lot of us during this time of COVID-19 have been more virtually engaged with each other and you get to really see a lot of inside of people's spaces. Like I was commenting earlier that you have an awesome spinning wheel <laughs> in yeah. your face. And it's, it's fun because you almost, this has been like a unique time to be able to see into the living spaces and the working spaces and the worlds of people that you never normally would get to see. And all of a sudden we're all flung into each other's living rooms <laughs> and like dining rooms and kitchen tables. So I guess that all just goes to say is, has, and then as an artist, has the pandemic um, affected how you work and where you work? Like, is your workspace your home? Or do you have a studio? Or are you at home, but you can't work because you're just so preoccupied with what's going on? Or have you like really thrown caution to the wind and taken advantage of it and plowed into your work? And so I guess that's my question is, in any way, perceivably good or bad, because I don't really think there's a good or bad way for artwork to be made. But has like the pandemic affected your art process or where you are, where you work on your art or how you make art? Yes, actually, 
Um, COVID kind of hit at a really unexpected time for me. I had just moved here to Montana. Um, didn't really know anyone, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't know the area. And um, back in St. Louis, I actually shared a studio space with two other of my friends who I graduated with. Um, and I really liked that because it was its own creative space where I could kind of do anything. Um, I could get away from home. Mm -hmm. And being forced to kind of stay here at home has um, kind of shut down my creative process. I won't lie. It's, it's been a little harder for me because um, I have no way to really separate my home life from my creative life. Mm -hmm. um, just because I don't find myself working in those kind of conditions. I um, can't seem to really separate myself and that's kind of what I need. I need a little bit of a separation. So for me, it, it's been a little bit harder. Um, I also haven't, I don't really have the space right now to work in sculpture at all. And so that's been really hard for me too, is not having that space available where I can just do something really crazy and be mm -hmm. okay with it. Um, cause I need to keep my apartment clean. <laughs> yes. Not burn anything to the ground in your Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to burn anything and wax is really hard to get off of things. So, um, for me, it, it's, it's been a little bit of a struggle with that, but I find myself doing a lot more, um, sketching and, um, some very small paintings, but not what I really truly want to do. And for me, that's just, now it's trying to find the space for me to do that. How do you see the arts as being vital to our society, especially now? And why do you think that art is important to make? Well, I think I said, a, a I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I think art's vital to start conversations. Mm -hmm. I think it's there to push boundaries. And I actually think we're not talking enough. I think people are talking at each other, but not to each other. I think we're, people are more concerned with surrounding themselves with people with the same beliefs as them. So they're not willing to actually go out and talk about something that they don't necessarily believe in or understand. And so they've kind of walled themselves in and they're not open to new ideas or conversations. So I think art is very important to kind of break down those boundaries, talk about those taboos, and really kind of open ourselves up. I mean, mm -hmm. I spent the, the past summer in Germany and we were looking at the memorials to World War II there. Mm -hmm. And they're everywhere. And it's talking about our past and talking about the issues and the bad things that happened. And they're very much there to say, this will never happen again. Mm -hmm. But I think our biggest issue right now is that we're trying to cover up those things. People are not willing to actually talk about the things that have happened and understand and say, yes, they were wrong and this is why. And then people have to be willing to listen and understand. And that's how we're going to be able to solve things, but people aren't doing that. So for me, art is vital to understanding and to start conversations mm -hmm. and kind of push those boundaries. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for giving me your time today and telling me about your art and your artistic process. It's really fascinating, and it's a pleasure to have you at the museum now um, and also in our exhibition. So thank you so much for talking with me today and for sharing your artwork with us. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Really have enjoyed it.